Hello, everyone. My name is Bear Shea. I am the DOE Mental Health and School Counselor Specialist. And I am here to have a conversation with you all uh, about loss and grief during this time of crisis for COVID-19. My peers and I, as we've been providing content areas um, out to the field, we've been able to have some really great conversations with educators from all walks, from all over Maine, from administrators to school counselors, to teachers, to ed techs, um, and even support staff. And this has been a really great opportunity to connect with you and to try to provide the support we can. What we found is, is that in having a lot of these conversations, a topic that comes up over and over again, no matter what the content area, is really this feeling of loss, of not feeling connected, of feeling separated from what so many of our passions are um, and what's what so much of us do as far as being connected with our schools and our students and our communities and that that loss is really carrying a lot of heavy feelings a lot of mixed emotions a lot of uh, complex barriers that have been coming up and so what i wanted to try to do today was to have a really short brief overview of what grief and loss uh, can look like during a time of crisis and how we can use this information to support each other and really to focus on ourselves. Um, so I'd like to explore this with you all. And uh, I hope this is something that we can sort of open up and listen to for ourselves. We tend to do trainings and listen for uh, learning for our teachers or for our students or for others. This is really for us as educators. So let's take a look. I think one of the things we've been hearing a lot, um, this is the new normal. This is how things are going to be. I think it's really important to acknowledge that this isn't normal. It isn't anything that should be normal, that will be normal. This is what it is right now. We're still in this crisis. I know that it's felt like a really long time. And for most of us who um, haven't experienced crises before, it's by far the longest crisis. You know, we're really used to in the States dealing with short-term crises that are related to natural disasters and weather. And this has been one of the longer crises for, for most of us. And, and that's can be really unsettling and jarring, but that this is in no way normal. And none of the things that we're feeling are normal. They are all due to this crisis. And that those feelings are actually expected. It's what we should, what should be happening. And there's a whole host of ways that that's going to affect us. Looking at just basic fear, anxiety, worry, just having the unknown lodged sort of in the background on the back burner, never really knowing what's going to happen, what, what are the next steps going to be, not able to plan. All of those things cause a lot of stress and they really start to react with the survival parts of our brain. And those pieces come together to really add a whole new emotional layer, changing moods, feeling on edge, um, affecting our physical uh, health as well. Um, and, you know, this sort of feeling of exhaustion, of um, withdrawing from preferred activities, all of these pieces are things that very well could be affecting us and really should be. If, you know, I'm, I get concerned when somebody says, oh, everything's fine. I'm, I haven't been affected by this at all. That's when there's a worry. When there's a crisis like this that is affecting all of us so significantly, these should be what we are noticing. And it's important to validate that and not try to pretend that they're not. Another big piece of this is how we as human beings operate um, when there's a crisis. For us, uh, loss and change and, a, and grief can be really unique. And that, that process for us when, it's, when we are experiencing it individually can be really specific. What we know about human beings is that when there are crises and emergencies that affect uh, the communities at large, that really there's a very specific stage stages that we follow as human beings. And unfortunately, we have a lot of evidence of this. Um, and it doesn't make a difference what country we're in, what language we speak. Um, all human beings tend to respond to crises in the same way. And that looks a lot like this. Um, when you think about some of the emotional highs and lows that came about when we started hearing about COVID, um, we started witnessing what was going on in other countries. We started seeing that sort of pre-disaster phase and then really when the impact happened in the United States, um, there was this sort of huge uh, uh, unity of all of us coming together and starting to look at how can we make sure that we are protecting people and keeping safe 
um, and knowing that there's going to be costs and there are going to be personal sacrifices for us. And there's that sort of spike of unity and that emotional high. Right now, we are squarely in the disillusionment phase. And that disillusionment encompasses all sorts of areas. Um, a lot of the disagreements on how the um, economy is impacted, on whether to wear masks or not to wear masks, or whether to open businesses or not. And you can see that um, with each one of those uh, options, there's sort of, a, again, a, a spike of unity. And then again, at sometimes even a greater falling off um, as those emotional lows really start to stack up. And we have sort of event after event after event that is really weighing on us. And that's really tied in with the greater social scene that's going on in the United States and also the world and how all of these uh, different um, pieces that we had that were already complicated and difficult uh, in our culture are now affected by COVID and sometimes exacerbated. And so that's gonna go with this. It's really not moving yet towards that, um, th that sort of point where we've shifted out of this. We are still in this crisis and it looks like we are going to be for a period of time. And we're not sure what that is. And so all of that unknown, again, really goes to play into where our minds are at and how our coping um, and our brain is, is handling all of this stress and unknown. Our brains really don't like change. Um, and it, it really brings us into this space, uh, this idea of being in between, right? We, we like things to be one way or another. Um, our brains are, are at their best when they sort of know where they are. The idea of not knowing is, is a threat, right? Not, not being able to plan, to protect, um, to know what all of the angles are. Uh, it, it allows our brain to sort of try to figure out all of these different possibilities and it's an incredible burden and an incredible weight. When we're in a space of loss, when we um, have had a significant change, we're caught in this in-between space, in this liminal space where we really have come out of something and we're in the middle of trying to figure out what that looks like. And we really haven't figured out yet if this, if sort of these are where things are and we're changing into this next space. And that discomfort is really tough on us. When we talk about loss, there's lots of different kinds of loss. And I think in our culture, sometimes we don't realize how loss affects us. You know, we, we do a really good job of acknowledging um, when there's loss of life and, and how that can affect us. But really, any kind of loss for our brain puts a weight on it and puts us in an emotional state. For us, those structures and norms, the way that we are used to going to our jobs, going to our schools, seeing our buildings, our classrooms, um, our students, all of those connections, um, that is a really big loss. Even though we're still able to reach out and connect in this platform as a way of um, trying to achieve some of that connection, it's not the same the relationships we have with our students. We, we know that um, we are a, a source of resilience for so many of our students. Um, and it's not only just us providing that support to them, it's really the benefit and, and love that we get um, in, in working with students that we love. It's part of our passion, it's part of why we do what we do. And the loss of that is, can be really um, compounding on everything else that's going on for us. We're not able to share our passions, we're not able to celebrate milestones um, you know, we're, we're missing out on all of these things that we really loved being educators. Um, and, and we also know that the safety and security for some of our students um, is, is at risk now that they are not in a physical building. And this really leads to that feeling of grief, which is just that normal and natural emotional reaction to loss. And it's something that um, we as a culture don't talk about very well and don't explore very well. We have a lot of ideas of what grief is supposed to be or what it's supposed to look like, but it's not something we often have conversations with. One of the things that we hear about a lot is, oh, there's a process to, to grief. There's, um, there are these stages that we go through. But imagine grief more as like a complex gear system. So when we look at a, a, an old fashioned pocket watch and we see all these different gears, they are working together and each one of them is eventually leading to moving things forward However, for those of us who aren't trained in it, it's impossible to tell what gear does which. There are some that are spinning much faster, some that are spinning much slower, some that don't seem to have any point whatsoever, and yet they're all part of that system. And that grief for us is an emotional experience. It's not something that we can go through in a logical way. And a lot of us, you know, we like to be rational. We like to be able to think and plan. 
it's one of the um, one of the gifts that we have as human beings is is to really be able to think through things. And grief isn't a rational process. Um, there's going to be emotions that don't make sense. There's going to be times where we're really um, happy and excited that our students are going to be graduating and that they're going to be moving on to new buildings and, and to other programs. And at the same time, we are going to feel an incredible amount of sadness and loss that we aren't there to celebrate that with them. And so we have these conflicting feelings that are happening at the same time. And that there might be these bursts of grief where some days we're feeling a little more solid and like things are moving forward. And then other days where we just really feel overwhelmed by it. And that overwhelming can become a barrier in our lives. Going back to that sort of uh, idea of grief and stages, right? We have the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and you sort of go through these as a linear process. The thing is, is that when we're talking about a crisis situation, you know, those, those, that sort of stages of grief is really specific for uh, certain kinds of grieving. What we're talking about here is such a large overarching uh, piece that we share as a community. And, and those stages don't really apply. It's not a linear process. You know, uh, yes, those years are all working together, but it, you can't tell what, what spot is going to where. It's going to feel messy. Um, our brains don't like messy, right? We want to be planful. We want to be rational. Um, but knowing that there are cycles that are involved, that um, there can be swings in intensity and frequency, just like I was saying, those, the, the idea of a grief burst, that there are going to be times where we're overwhelmed. That's part of this process. Um, and, and while it won't be linear and we won't necessarily know where we are even in the process, it is part of that system of gears. It's really important to acknowledge that it's a unique experience um, and, and that grieving for us um, is going to look really different than it will be for other people in our lives. And that in our culture, we tend to have a, an expectation of what grieving look like, looks like, that it's you know, crying or that it's, um, you know, huddled up in a blanket on the couch, right? Like these are things in our, um, in our psyche that we're sort of used to is what grief looks like, what we see in movies, what, what we experienced in other people grieving. But we should know that grief is really individual and that um, while we're going to feel those emotions, how we feel those and what those emotions are, are unique to us and that that's okay, that that is our process and that it's part of that larger system of gears. The other piece to know about a crisis like this is that this is a shared experience. All of us are going through this in one way or another. And one of the important parts about having this conversation with you as educators is that there are unique parts about being an educator during COVID-19 and the unique parts of loss that we're experiencing, but that we are experiencing them together. And so that's, that, that's a unique part of this that we can really tap into to help us. So when we scan out and we look at this sort of source of gears, we know that there are things that we can do, that there are actions that we can take to help us move through this process um, and this grief. A lot of it is really understanding and giving ourselves permission for what are the things that are going on? How do we validate this process for ourselves? That we are going to experience emotions, that this is going to uh, affect our physical limitations, and that there are going to be times we're going to feel exhausted and as much as I'd like to blame it on all the Zoom meetings, it's, it's not just that. It's not just the stress of, of our job. It is part of the grieving process to feel that intensity. Um, and, and a big part of it in our culture is like, I need to get up and go out and do and, uh, and make sure that, that, you know, I'm putting on a brave face. And, and we have a lot of shame that we should be doing things when we're grieving. And it's really important not to put that on ourselves, but to let it be part of our process. We don't have to move forward to grieve. There really is a piece of having, feeling stuck, feeling like we are still, um, not having to try to solve everything in the moment, but really let those emotions be present for us. It's an important part of the grieving process. And again, it's sort of one of those gears that's spinning off to the side that we might not be used to. There are some other pieces that are more action oriented. So. As we were saying, this is more of a, a shared experience. It, are there people that we can talk out, talk to, and reach out to and connect with in a way that is part of sharing this, uh, the impact? Having some rituals. We've been talking a lot about transitions for students and creating rituals for them to solidify the memories. Having some of the rituals that we, we used to experience for graduations and changes that are different now and how important it is to hold on to those. 
Another big part of our culture is we love to help other people. And because grief is such a unique experience, it's really important that we accept help that is helpful for us and that we communicate when, when people want to help, but it's not helpful so that we're really getting the things we need and not adding an extra burden of people trying to help and it's not really working. Looking at our self-care is such an important piece. We talk about it all the time as educators, like what do we do for self-care? How do we uh, ease some of the stress that we have in a really stressful job? And how, how, I mean, let's be honest, how much of us actually engage in intentional self-care? And we have to know that the self-care we used before isn't effective for the crisis that we're in now. We need to be really intentional in building self-care practices that we're actually going to use and that are applicable to the level of impact that we're experiencing. That feeling of being stuck is going to be really, uh, it's going to come up a lot. We're going to feel stuck. We're going to feel those barriers. We're going to bump up against them. What are some things that we can do that are different? Ways to shake up that uh, malaise that's going on in our brain as our brain races through all of these possibilities. Sometimes just shifting to a new position um, can make a real difference. It doesn't have to be you know, getting up and going out and, and walking 10 miles. And I think ultimately one of the most important pieces is that if we're feeling out of control, if we're scared about the intensity of what's going on, if we're having thoughts of harming ourselves and that things feel really hopeless, it's really important that we immediately seek out support from trained professionals. These barriers can become something that can pile on enough so that we put ourselves at physical risk and that there are trained professionals that can help us with that. And I'll have some resources in the end of this as well as um, included with this presentation and conversation. So please take advantage of those. It's really important that we are aware when things feel overwhelming and that we're feeling hopeless. There are some foundational things that we all know and are aware of that we tell our students all the time, you know, but that we sort of, how often do we actually practice these things? Are we getting enough sleep? Are we getting regular activity? Are we eating healthy? You know, all of these pieces, um, you know, setting time aside, limiting screen, avoiding substances. These are all things that we know intrinsically. How often do we actually practice them? And how do we get back to a place that we're practicing them intentionally to uh, help ourselves through the grieving process, acknowledging that we are in a grieving process and that we can do these things to help out. Thinking about how we are social and emotionally, like this is, this is an emotional process. And so sometimes those, those practical pieces don't work as well. What are some of the things that we can do? Limiting our exposure to news. Um, sometimes staying busy is, is, a, is a good sort of coping skill to get through. However, being mindful that just staying busy and not going through the process and letting those gears spin can really uh, be a barrier for us. Looking at priorities that are manageable, right? How often do we get up and we're like, I'm feeling better. I'm going to go out and do all of these things. And sometimes when we don't meet those expectations, we actually get down on ourselves while we're already in, in a process of grief. Another great piece is connection and doing things for other people, reaching out and sharing this experience that we're having. These are ways that we already know how to care for ourselves. Even knowing all of these pieces, having these ideas that of how to support ourselves and how to support each other, there still is a really important piece to consider. And that's one of the things that's unique to us as educators. And that when, when we not only have all of these pieces going on for ourselves in the way that COVID has affected us and our loss and our grief, we also have an intimate understanding of how COVID has affected our students, has affected their families and our communities. And because of this, it adds a whole other layer to this loss and grief process, as well as just to the stress that's on top of us. And that's a really important thing that's unique to us as educators. And it's another place that we can share with each other, where we have this shared experience and we can talk about these things with each other because we understand them. It's not something that everybody understands, but it's really important for us to acknowledge this extra mental load that we carry during this process. I just want to say from all of us at the Department of Education, we are with you on this. We, we really are understanding the, the weight and the change of things that's happened. We are trying to do our very best to reach out, to connect with you, to provide any supports that we can, and really just stand by you during this time. I just want to say thank you for all that you guys have done to support our students, to connect with families, to really be there for your communities. Know that you are pillars, that you are, even during this time when we feel like there is loss and, and lack of connection, that you are a primary source of resilience for your students. 
that that connection, that that relationship that you have during this time is even more important. And I just want to say thank you so much for all of you that are putting in that extra effort, that are carrying this extra load. And thank you for all the planning and all of the things that you've taken on. And I look forward to working with you through the summer and into the fall for whatever that may look like. And I just want to let you all know that we are here and that we're going to keep going. So please reach out for anything that you need. And thank you.